Perfect. OK. So first, uh, let me thank the organizers for uh, putting this beautiful conference and also, uh, of course, for inviting me to tell you about the result we have in the field of disordered elastic systems. So I know I'm the only thing which stands between you and lunch, so I will try to uh, keep it uh, uh, reasonably short. Uh, I, I, I thought that this field would be covered by other speakers before, which is why I had prepared uh, initially a talk with more quantum aspects. But since I'm probably the first and even the last speaker to mention about this field of disordered elastic systems, I've changed a little bit the presentation to a more review-like uh, thing because uh, it's a beautiful system of uh, glasses that I think is worth uh, knowing a little bit uh, better. And as you will see, RSB played a very important role in it. Uh, I need to acknowledge, of course, the, the people who, 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 um, with whom I collaborated in this field, and one person deserves a very special mention. It's uh, Pierre Le Dussal because uh, we had a wonderful, and we're still having a wonderful collaboration in this field. All the key results uh, concerning the old work that I will show you have been obtained uh, with him, uh, and therefore uh, uh, is uh, really at the heart of the of the talk that I am going to tell you. There were, of course, many many other people. Some of them are in the audience uh, here. Uh, I quoted a couple of theorists. Uh, that are uh, present, in particular Elisabeth Agoritsas and Vivien Lecomte are in the audience, so all hard questions on domain walls are to be directed to them. And uh, we had wonderful collaboration with experimentalists, I'll show some of the results, uh, both on magnetic systems and on uh, uh, ferroelectric systems. And the more recent result that I would like to tell you have been obtained in collaboration with Ezekiel Ferrero, Laura Foini, Alejandro Colton and Alberto also will we'll come to that later uh, in the talk. Uh, I've put a couple of general references since I will have to go a little bit fast. If you want to know more about this field, uh, don't hesitate to have a look at them. There are, of course, uh, in the audience many, many people who pioneered this field, among them uh, Daniel Fisher, uh, who now moved to biology, but he, he was really uh, the, the primum mobile in uh, disordered elastic system. Uh, there is also a little advertisement for a volume of the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences, where there are contributions by several people, Laetitia, uh, ex various experimental groups, both on quantum and classical systems. So if you want to know more, uh, don't hesitate to look at this uh, reference. So what is the goal of the game? Well, uh, let's consider a system, uh, for example, an elastic string, uh, which has elastic forces that would like to keep the system flat, or a periodic system, I've drawn here a, a square lattice, but it can be an hexagonal lattice or whatever, with elasticity that would like to keep the system ordered. And on the top of it, we add a random potential, uh, quenched, of course, uh, which coupled to the density of the object, so for example here, uh, the, the string would like to go at the place where the disorder is strong, and there will be simply competition between the uh, elastic term, oops, the elastic term uh, which would like to have the object flat, let's say that way, and the disorder which would like to have the object rough. So it's a very uh, deceptively uh, simple problem, both for uh, domain wall interfaces here or for periodic systems. Now, uh, there are many experimental realizations. Vortices in a type two superconductor are a good example of periodic systems which form a vortex lattice, but disorder will play a role. Magnet, uh, domain wall in a magnetic system. This is how we can read and write information. Uh, so this has also practical consequence. Uh, ferroelectrics. Uh, which uh, are essentially like magnets instead of having, a, uh, sorry, but you have a, a, an electric moment instead of a magnetic moment. And we can continue uh, contact line uh, in a wetting uh, problem. And last but not least, and unfortunately I won't have much time to tell about it, uh, disordered bosons. You heard about many body localization, quantum particles plus disorder. Actually, in one dimension, this problem uh, that you can realize, for example, with ultra cold trapped uh, atoms, uh, something which looks like this experimentally, uh, is also a realization of a disordered elastic system. If I have the time, I'll try to explain uh, why. 
Now, of course, it's a very, very difficult problem because it's very clear that you have many competing uh, enclosed solutions, so we fall in the category uh, of glassy physics. And there is, of course, a, a wonderful paper by Marc Mezard and Giorgio Parisi, which applied the concept of replica symmetry breaking. Uh, so this is a little bit later than 79. Uh, this is 1991, but they applied it for uh, studying uh, the problem of a random manifold and how a random manifold can uh, change its behavior when it's put in the, in the disorder. And I must say for me, in my, my sort of personal timeline, this was really the paper which bling made me understand uh, replica symmetry breaking. I must say before I heard people at the Ecole Normale talk about spin glasses and whatever, but it all sounded very mysterious to me, like dark magic and puff, this was the clear uh, thing that I could uh, understand. So uh, this, uh, of course, uh, type of system have an extremely slow dynamics. We'll come back to, to, to it. And they have the behavior of a glass. Uh, what can you measure in this system? Well, that's the nice point. They are relatively easy to access for measurements. If you have a domain wall like this, you can measure the relative displacement correlation function, which tells you how rough the domain wall will be. And usually what happens is that you find that this grows, should have been R here, this grows uh, as a function of distance, as a power law of distance with an exponent that people call the roughness exponent. And if you are in 1D, there is even a miracle which is that you can compute the exponent exactly. Well, and it's of course connected to Cardar parisi zong equation. So I would say the, 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 the loop is closed. Uh, you can compute this exponent which in 1D has a value of two thirds. The thing which sounds relatively reasonable is that the interface here, because of the disorder, will become rough. So if you want, the positional order of the interface is, is lost. And this is something we could expect. The system will be a glass, so it will be very disordered, and so on and so forth. Uh, just to mention that one can measure this type of things. Here is a, a magnetic interface between spin up and let's say spin down here. Actually, you have two, two positions for the interface here, two images in one. Uh, and you can measure the relative displacement here on the experimental system. And when you plot the logarithm of this function as a function of the logarithm of the distance between the points you're looking at, you see very clearly a straight line, uh, which in principle should give you the roughness exponent. I say in principle because there is the issue on whether the measurement is done at equilibrium or uh, whether the system has been quenched out of equilibrium or whatever. I will not enter in, the, in this particular point. Uh, just to say that this particular measurement gives an exponent which is perfectly compatible with a value of around 0.6. Uh, so would be compatible with an, with an equilibrium value. Okay. Now, periodic systems are a little bit uh, more subtle a priori, but the idea is the same. And for a long time, people were believing that, okay, we have here a B of R. It should be a power law. It's a power law for the manifold. So it should be a power law for the periodic system. And so we can borrow all the technology and, 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 and study this type of problem. And there, it's relevant for a large number of experimental uh, situation. I quote the vortex in type two superconductors. Here is an image of a decoration experiment where you see the vortices at the surface of the material, which form clearly uh, uh, something which would like to be a periodic array. Uh, this would be also relevant. There are experiments uh, in semiconducting structure with Wigner crystal of two-dimensional electrons. And quite recently, uh, there has been a measurement on the so-called skirmion lattice, which are magnetic sort of edgehogs, uh, which have been realized and imaged, imaged. And this is an image which was taken at EPFL um, in the group of uh, Fabrizio Carbon. Okay, so uh, what happens for a periodic system? Well, the naive uh, reaction is to say, let's study as usual with a solid, the structure factor, which is the correlation of the density of the Fourier transform of the density. And we all know that in a perfect solid, this object has Bragg peaks 
at the vector of the reciprocal lattice of the original perfect lattice. And if we look more closely at one of the Bragg peaks, this Bragg peak is broadened by everything that can broaden a Bragg peak, disorder, uh, temperature, and so on and so forth. And the way to compute this broadening is to go back to the function of the displacement. And you can show that the shape of the Bragg peak in Q space is actually the Fourier transform of this correlation function, which is the exponential uh, of k, where k is the uh, reciprocal lattice vector here, times the displacement at point r correlated with exponential blah blah displacement at point zero. So if this correlation function decays fast to zero, the Bragg peak will be a Lorentzian-like or Gaussian-like form with finite height and finite width. If this thing is just always zero, you have a perfect solid, the Bragg peak would be a delta function centered at k0. And so, uh, actually, if you assume near Gaussian fluctuation, you can show that this correlation function is just the exponential of the autocorrelation function b of r that I mentioned before. So you immediately see that if b of r is a power law, this will decay exponentially, and you lose the positional order. So this was kind of the, I would say, urban legend that was going on, that actually you would lose the positional order uh, exponentially fast, uh, because it should be like a random manifold. And this was well compatible with the idea of a glass, uh, because a glass must be disordered. OK, and actually the surprise that we had with Pierre when we started to work on this uh, subject, and I will cut a, a long story uh, very short, is that this was completely wrong. And the way we could uh, make the calculation was by using the very method that was in the paper by uh, Mezar and Parisi, which is this um, a variational method using replica symmetry breaking and using a little trick borrowed from quantum physics on how to express the density uh, of particles in terms of various harmonics. But using this, we could relate this problem to a random sine gordon problem, if you want, and then compute explicitly the function b of r and thus the structure factor. And the big surprise is that, indeed, it starts with a power law for the roughness, but very rapidly, along, uh, beyond a certain characteristic length scale, uh, that I don't want to discuss in detail here, the displacement become, the autocorrelation of the displacement become logarithmic, and therefore the uh, structure factor decays. This correlation here decays as a power law, which means the Bragg peak is divergent, just like or near like in a perfect solid. Actually, if the exponent was temperature dependent, you would say, oh, it's a BKT system with a, with a, with a quasi long range order. Here, of course, the temperature does not enter in the exponent. This is a number, if you want. And uh, the, this is due to this order. But the point is that you get quasi long range order. And that was a big surprise. And this led to the discovery of a glassy phase, which we call the Bragg glass, because, OK, it's a glass and it has Bragg peaks. So, OK, lack of imagination. Sorry, uh, this is, uh, these results are for three dimensions, if you want. Uh, in two dimensions, one had to worry seriously about the dislocations that could also occur. Uh, which picture is in 2D? You mean this one? No, I mean the results you're saying. Ah, the result that I'm quoting is for three dimensions. The 3D one also has to worry about. Yeah, you have also to worry about dislocations. So for the moment, let me ignore the dislocations. This result is for an elastic theory, and there it's... Uh, Proof. Then there is the second step of worrying about whether dislocations are generated or not. Uh, let me skip this discussion uh, here. Uh, as, as you know very well, uh, we had argument that dislocation should not be generated because the quasi-long range order is preserved for the elastic theory. We can come back to that, but let me skip the, this part because it's not relevant for what I want to discuss today. Is it okay? OK, so uh, the, another thing which is uh, interesting is that it was a system on which one could solve by using this very beautiful RSB variational uh, approach that I mentioned. But actually, there was, a very, uh, there was another very beautiful method that was uh, pioneered actually by uh, Daniel, which is a functional renormalization group, which was working in 4 minus epsilon expansion. And this was one of the few systems where we could get both solutions working together. And actually, in epsilon, if you make the calculation of this parameter 
the prefactor of the log coming from the RSB, and if you make it coming from the FRG, the two factors agree within 10% of each other, showing that at least the physics and even the semi-quantitative results you get for this system were in excellent agreement. Okay. Sorry. Say it again. So in epsilon, of course, the FRG is right. And the variational is approximative. Now, if I go to D equal 3, I would not trust the result by just putting epsilon equal 1 from the FRG. And the variational method has the great advantage that A, it gives us a better estimate. And B, it allows us to take all type of complications that are coming for shear, uh, you know, compression and blah, blah, blah modulus that we need to do for realistic experimental system. And that would be super hard to do with the FRG. So I think both methods are super useful. And the fact that we could put them together uh, for me was great. But when we did the calculation in D equal three, we used more the variational method. Okay, uh, just to uh, go fast. Uh, and show you that there were experiments that were confirming this result. Here is a decoration image uh, showing a, a very, very uh, good and clean image of vortices. You will notice they are not perfectly ordered, but indeed they are uh, exhibiting quasi-long range order. This was uh, obtained uh, uh, by Philip Kim uh, uh, um, using bitter decoration technique. And a very precise measurement of the Bragg peaks uh, could be done on a compound which is called the BKBO, it doesn't matter, uh, by Thierry Klein in Grenoble, where uh, using neutron scattering experiment, one could do a, a very precise calculation, uh, sorry, measurement of the structure factor and compare with the theoretical prediction. And this was in excellent agreement. Okay. How do I decide it's a glass? Because if I look at it, it looks like a solid. So how do I decide it's a glass? Well, I decide it's a glass by looking at the dynamics uh, of this type of system. And this is also very nice because this system, they can be put in motion very easily by adding a force. For the superconductor, you just put a current in the system. For the magnetic domain walls, you just put a magnetic field. And this will make the system move. So uh, looking at the dynamics is a way to probe the energy landscape. So at t equals zero, uh, we have a deepening transition. You need a critical force to make the, uh, the, the system move. And then you will get a finite velocity as a function of the force. And you can expect, and this type of studies were, were pioneered by, by Daniel, you can expect a type of critical behavior at the deepening transition with uh, exponents and so on and so forth, a divergent correlation length uh, and the like. Now, uh, if you are at zero temperature, everything is fine. If you are at finite temperature, you have the challenge to include the thermal effects to this picture. And this has consequence. So I will not discuss the consequence for the statics. Uh, for a single line, this has deep consequence. As I said, if you want to know more, ask Elizabeth or Vivian. Uh, also for the periodic, there are new length scales that appear in the static. And this was something we looked at with uh, Laura Foyni. But of course, the most drastic consequence are for the dynamics. So the first thing that you can expect is that there will be a thermal rounding of the deepening. If you think of this as a critical phenomenon, like applying a magnetic field on an easing model, you know that here you will have a power law of the magnetic field. Well, you can expect here to have a power law of the temperature for the velocity at Fc. And lo and behold, when you do calculations, uh, you find that the velocity is indeed at Fc, a power law of the temperature with a certain critical exponent. I want to emphasize that this is an out of equilibrium system. And at the moment, we have absolutely no theory, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody has, on how to compute this exponent from first principle. We can measure it in a numerical calculation, but we have no idea, at least I don't, uh, on how to compute it theoretically. So I think it's an interesting uh, uh, challenge uh, for the theorists to do this. Uh, it's an even more strong challenge since now there are experimental systems. Here is a, is a magnetic domain wall where people can measure very precisely by putting a magnetic field, the velocity, and they will see the various regime, the deepening and so on, and they can control the temperature. For example, here is a measurement 
of this deepening exponent that has been done in this, uh, in this paper. So there is a challenge, a theoretical challenge, which is what the hell, how the hell can we compute uh, this um, exponent? Now, another big challenge uh, is to understand what happens when you have a very low driving force, because now you're probing the system with an extremely small force, so the system can only move by overcoming barriers, and clearly because it's a glass, the barrier will diverge, which means the response will not be linear with the applied force. And actually, this is something that uh, was investigated very early. Uh, there were scaling hypotheses that were done by Joffe and Vinokur and also Thomas Natterman. And we uh, could use the FRG with Pascal Chauve and Pierre Le Dussal to put more flesh on the bones of this calculation. And the net result is that you should expect here uh, a, a non-linear response, a stretch exponential response, which traduces the divergence of the barrier uh, in the glass. And what you can expect is that the velocity will be a stretch exponential of the one over the force with an exponent which is actually related to the equilibrium roughness exponent. So it's a beautiful formula that gives you a relation between an out-of-equilibrium property and uh, a static one. Uh, I'll pass on the calculation, but let me show you an experiment which was done on these magnetic domain walls. Here is the velocity which is measured uh, as a function of 1 over h to the power 1 quarter. And 1 quarter is not a fitting parameter, it's just obtained by putting zeta equal 2 thirds, so the kpz value here, 2 thirds, in this formula, you will get mu equal 1 quarter. Note that the fit, uh, this gives you a straight line, and this gives you a straight line between something which is 25 on an Eperian log, so this is 11 orders of magnitude. So this is really the way to test for a stretch exponential. Uh, similar results were obtained in the group of Patricia Parouche uh, on ferroelectrics, and again, the, the creep law is uh, confirmed and gives you information on what is the dimension of your random manifold and also allows you to confirm uh, value for the equilibrium exponents. Now, uh, perhaps I will uh, uh, not discuss too much the business of the, of the two length scales because my time is running short. I will just simply mention that now, uh, let me skip this. I will just simply mention that uh, in order to study more finely dynamics, we need to have uh, good tools, and uh, analytically it's very difficult. We, we, the only tool we, we manage to make working is the FRG, but it's very tough to uh, solve practically the equations. So uh, as Anderson was saying in his Nobel Prize lecture for Anderson localization, we had to resort to the indignity of numerical calculations. Uh, but numerical calculation, it's very tough to do. Because if you do molecular dynamics, the time scale are absolutely humongous uh, because of this exponential relaxation. So uh, we had to develop a couple of uh, algorithms. So there was one exact enumeration algorithm in collaboration with Alej uh, Alejandro Colton, Alberto Orso, and Werner Kraut that was extremely useful uh, and which allowed us to study the dynamics below the critical field here. Uh, in the system and to uh, evidence uh, a new length scale that is appearing inside the, 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 let's say, the phase, I don't know if I should call it the phase, but the regime where the force is much smaller than uh, Fc. If we want to go in the creep regime, the limit of very small force, this exact enumeration algorithm is not useful. There are simply too many configurations to uh, enumerate. And so recently, there was a second algorithm, uh, which I will not try to describe, I will just mention it, that allows to access this uh, regime. Uh, uh, in practice, we could divide the minimum force we can reach by a factor of 100, and which allowed us to confirm not only the creep formula, but also to get IDs on the distribution of avalanches in the motion inside this, uh, this regime. So for example, uh, here is a picture of the avalanches. So this is uh, the time sequence here, and the color code indicates when you get an event where the line is moving forward. You see that around the deepening transition, the avalanches are essentially uncorrelated. They occur everywhere along the line. And in the creep regime, you have a very, very different behavior of avalanches. And to understand this physics is, of course, uh, highly uh, non-trivial. 
Uh, in the one minute that I am left, I would still I would like to mention that the same concepts and the same physics applies to quantum problems. And I just want to show you an action. If you take these ordered bosons and you use a technique which is known as bosonization, if you don't know what it is, I can recommend you a very good book on the subject. Uh, what happens is that your action for bosons in 1D in interaction with disorder will be this one, where phi is a field which is related to the density of the bosons. So this, is, this looks like an elastic action, where uh, this looks like a 2D elastic action. K depends on the interaction and plays the role of the temperature for a classical problem. And this term here is very much like the term you would get for the periodic classical term. This is a random sine Gordon. And this, uh, uh, the difference is that in a classical problem, these two times here would be equal, uh, contrarily to what happens for the, quantum, uh, for the quantum problem. This can be studied by a renormalization group technique. And when you do this, this is something we did a long time ago with Ein Schulz, you will find that there is a transition between a superfluid and a localized phase. And if at that time you find in the RG that D becomes super big, and that you have the idea of expanding the cosine, which is a very natural thing to do, you find that there is nonsense. And of course, expanding the cosine is keeping the symmetric solution. But at that time, I had absolutely no clue of what replica symmetry breaking was. So I got stuck with uh, uh, not being able to do anything in the strong coupling phase. Actually, it's not completely true because there is a magic point where you can represent this in terms of fermions and solve the problem. But uh, for a generic parameter, you cannot do. And uh, then uh, using the same variational method uh, then was used for the classical system. Uh, we could, with Pierre Le Dussal, study the strong coupling phase. Uh, and of course, this has a one-step replica symmetry breaking, uh, which makes that you should be careful if you want to expand the cosine. I won't go in details, uh, but this type of phases, this type of phase transition, they can be now uh, well tested well tested in experiments in cold atoms. So here are experiments that were done in the group of Giovanni Modugno and Massimo Inguccio in Florence at the Lens. And we helped a little bit with theory. Uh, Guillaume Roux and Thomas Bartel did extensive DMRG calculation uh, for, for this problem. And you see here a phase diagram as a function of the interaction, the repulsion between the bosons, the strengths of the disorder. Actually, it's not a true disorder. It's a quasi-periodic system. And this is the width of the single particle correlation peak. So when this width is very narrow, the system is a superfluid. When this width is very large, the system is localized. And you see very clearly that there is a transition that exists between these two type of uh, phases. OK, it's time for me to conclude. I, I showed you that disordered elastic system cover a wide range of problems, both on classical and quantum world, which are deeply connected to glassy physics. Uh, and uh, RSB has proven a, an incredible tool to tackle the physics in this system, especially for this random sine Gordon model that seem to pop up every time you get a periodic system. So mentioning another tool from the country in which I live, I think it's much more useful than a Swiss knife, so I really appreciate this method. Of course, there are many, many open questions that remain for classical system thermal effect, calculation of length scale, avalanches, and so on and so forth. And for quantum system, glassiness, aging, finite temperature are, of course, uh, definitely on the table. And on that, I stop, and I thank you for your attention. So, thank you. Thank you. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> because everything diverges first, and the regularization occurs in a regime where the RG, which is established perturbatively in a way, is very hard to control. So I'm not saying one cannot do it. We tried very hard. We tried very hard. Not necessarily. We tried very hard, and we could not. 
control enough the solution so that we are happy with the result. We can discuss more in details, uh, but uh, in, the, in the very small force, we can control it because the velocity is exponentially small in the force. And we have a kind of structure that allows us to do it. You're right that in principle we have the equations and we should be able to do something with it. The very low velocity, that's coming from a scaling argument, right? Sorry? That's coming from a scaling argument, the one which you have, this, this creed. No, 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 no. No, no, there is the scaling argument which was done by Joffe Vinocur and Natterman, which uh, we confirm, but the result we obtained was obtained from the FRG. So if you want, we obtain the identity of the exponent in epsilon. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, give it, uh, prove it to uh, all values of epsilon. But no, the, the, the creep formula comes from the FRG. In that regime, we can control the FRG enough that we trust that what we get. Hey, tell me about, I mean, the question about dislocation. Yes. Can this, the, these RFP methods enable you to get this, to handle dislocation in three dimensions? That's a very good question. Uh, so in 2D, we, we wrote uh, the, the coupled equation of the disorder plus, uh, plus dislocations. In 3D, we have a paper with Pierre where uh, we work out, uh, well, no, in 2D, we have, a, we have a paper where we work out the fugacity of dislocations. And there, we think we have it under control. In 3D, as you know, I mean, you wrote also a paper on the subject, it's not so easy. So we have this energy argument, which is just an argument, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, a, a clean, complete calculation is uh, still uh, missing. In 2D, what I can tell you is that what we can show, and there we, we control the solution, is that if the disorder is weak, the length at which dislocation would appear would be parametrically large compared to the length array. So already in 2D, if the disorder becomes weak, you could get the Bragg glass over kilometers uh, before you turn to uh, a conventional uh, system with dislocations. So whether in 3D dislocation never appear, or whether they appear at an even more kilometric length scale, I would say in practice it probably makes no difference. We think they don't appear. But if you ask me to sign with a calculation, a mathematical guaranteed calculation, I think it's, it's still on the table. Any, any other question? No? No. Let's no, send. I think, I think oh. yes. Yeah, 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 I showed you the, the value. Uh, 0.15, 0, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's known very well experimentally. Well, it's known well experimentally. It's, it's known even better numerically. Numerically, we have very precise value of the exponent. But I have no idea on how to compute it. So that's... And of course, you cannot use scaling as in a normal critical phenomenon because this is an out of equilibrium... Uh, Yes. yes. Can you shout because I... So, of course, the, 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 the things between depending and creep are very different in nature. So, uh, uh, in the depending, the motion proceeds essentially by, by saddle point, by, by force which is enough to uh, make you slide over the, the, the saddle point. If you're in the creep, you really have to jump by Arrhenius activations in the barrier. So one thing which I didn't discuss is that if you take a photograph of the line, actually what you will see, and you measure in motion the, 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 the exponent of the line in motion, you have something which is very different if you're around the depinning transition, where you have the roughness which corresponds to the depinning, or if, you deep, if you're deep here, you will see the line for a long, long distance, you will see the line with an equilibrium exponent. So yes, these two regimes are very, very different. And one interesting question is how the barriers here, which are diverging as one over the power of the force, will scale down when you approach the depinning, the numerics seems to indicate they scale down linearly as you approach the deep end. Yeah. I want to just make one very general comment. Yes. Ken Wilson's name maybe hasn't even been mentioned here. Um, the 
the, the, the big advantage of real relational frameworks, whether they're exact or approximate and so on, is they are in within them, they can show you how they break down. Yes. Right? And so the structure yes. is within it. So how it breaks down doesn't mean you can get, when it breaks down, doesn't mean you get the answer for it, but at least you know it's wrong. Yes. And I think the problem with a lot of formal methods is what doesn't happen. Right? And one of the, in one of the examples you know, discussed um, two days ago about the um, you know, expansions in, in uh, radicalizing models and so on, supersymmetry things, is it, it's very elegant, but it doesn't have a way of telling when it goes wrong. So. And that the whole language, you know, the important thing about real relation is really the language. And the language of it sort of intrinsically has that, has that in it. So uh, let me reply to that. Of course, uh, as you know, I love renormalization group, at least for the quantum problem. This was the way to get the solution. But I also learned to love variational methods. Uh, as you know, both BCS and Laughlin uh, wave functions are variational approaches, you know, which, which at the end allowed to solve the problem. And in that case, the comment I can make is that this variational method using replica symmetry breaking was definitely a, a wonderful method and it's a practical tool that is a wonderful complement of what we can do with the, with the FRG. So I think it's a very fortunate situation that we have a problem on which we can apply both methods, confront them, and usually one is strong when the other has problems. And that, that I really like. So I, I love both tools. I think they are both incredibly useful. And it would be bad in my Swiss knife to only keep one blade. Let's say it that way. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.